And we are back for another episode of TPS, The Productivity Show, the number one podcast when it comes to productivity and efficiency. So my name is Tan. I'm the founder and CEO of Aging Efficiency. And with me today, I have Brooks Duncan, my co-host of the podcast. How are you today? I'm great. Really excited about this topic. It's something I've done a lot of thinking about. Uh, so really excited to get into it on the podcast. Yeah, this is kind of like your claim to fame in many ways. So I'm really excited to uh, share with you uh, and everyone else listening in some of the things that we've come up with when it comes to being efficient and saving time around organizing your files, notes, and photos. So uh, before we start diving in, one of the things we always like to do on the show is share some of our favorite productivity resources as a legal. I have three of them here for you. So the first one is an app called Duplicate Cleaner Pro, and this is specifically for Windows. So if you're someone who has trouble uh, finding duplicate files or you run into the issue of you're dealing with a lot of duplicate files and you're not sure which ones are duplicates, which ones are not, uh, this is a really handy tool to one, find duplicate files and two, handle them efficiently and effectively as well. So you can get rid of the duplicate files, sometimes which can take up to terabytes, if not gigabytes of data. So uh, go check that out, Duplicate Cleaner Pro for Windows. And then if you're on the Mac, there's a similar app called Gemini 2 by a different company, but it has the same functionality. So it allows you to find duplicate files and deal with them more effectively. So whether you're on Windows or Mac, there's something in it for you. And then the third resource, as I, as I mentioned before, that is related to this topic is a book. And that is called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Now, you might have heard of this book. There's even a Netflix show uh, based on this book uh, by Marie Kondo. And it's all about the, the idea of like organizing your physical space. And uh, there's a lot of parallels when it comes to organizing your physical space and your digital life as well. But today's episode is going to be more about the digital life. But I want to encourage uh, this resource as well, because there's no book on digital organization right now, at least. So go check out those resources. We'll have links to all of them in the show notes as well. So don't worry if you miss something. You can always go to theproductivityshow.com slash 351 and find them there as well. All right, uh, Brooks, uh, we're going to be talking about organizing your files, notes, and photos. Uh, for those who are listening, um, some of them might be asking, you know, why is this even relevant? Why should I even bother listening to this episode? What would you tell these people, Brooks? Yeah, well, organization in general and digital organization is part of that really hits all sorts of different areas of our work life and our personal life. So you might have stuff scattered all over the place and you can't find anything that just leads to lower productivity, or maybe like you have a decent filing system. Uh, you, you know, you're not too bad. Uh, there are always ways to improve it and become a little bit faster, a little bit more efficient. And as we'll talk about these little changes really do add up over time. So we want to give you an easy system to get started with this. And if you have been listening to the productivity show for a while, or maybe you're new, that's great too. Uh, we always talk about this concept called the T framework. And these are the three components of productivity, which uh, we call time, energy, and attention. And if you have all three of these firing, you're going to be in really, really good shape. You almost can't help but you be in really, really good shape productivity wise. But if one or more is lacking, then you might have some challenges and opportunities uh, to become a little bit more pro uh, pro productive. And really lack of organization you know, it touches on all three, but the main ones are time. So if you have an organization system that isn't great, uh, we waste a lot of time filing stuff away uh, and, and, you know, just lack of organization. And if you don't have an organization system, or if you're not consistent with using the one that you have, then you waste time digging around trying to find that file, that note, that photo uh, that we need. Whenever we need something, it just takes a lot longer than it needs to. So that's time. And then attention, you know, we can't really truly be focused or be present at work if we're frustrated because we're always like looking for stuff and we're, we know uh, we have this dread that we're going to have to like dig into our email inbox to find that attachment that somebody sent us. And we've talked to many of our readers and uh, podcast listeners over, over time who just say it like really puts them off their game 
by having this lack of organization. So it, it kind of hits both both parts, time and attention. And if you can improve those, which we're going to be talking about today, you're really setting yourself up for success. Yeah, the analogy I always like to give people when it comes to organization like this is, I know everyone has the experience of a really cluttered home, right? If your home is a huge mess, there's clothes everywhere, there's dishes in the sink that are unwashed and still dirty, there's stuff out of place, um, your desk has like papers and notes all over the place. It makes it really difficult to focus and it feels like a little bit of a drag on your attention, but also you're wasting a lot of time because you oftentimes can't find stuff immediately. And it's really frustrating as well. And it can sometimes drain your energy even at the same time. And so when you realize that your place is such a mess, one of the best things you can do is to clean up your place, have it all organized, and it makes it so much easier to focus, right? And it just takes a little bit of organization to kind of get to that place. And the, the thing that we realize is that there's no specific list of things or recommendations or best practices, best practices for digital organization. So we kind of want to introduce some of those ideas here on this episode. And uh, the audio form, format is great. However, <laughs> we've decided that uh, we also want to do a live webinar on this topic to kind of walk you through in the visual format how we organize our files, notes, and photos. So if you're interested in joining us, you can go to theproductivityshow.com slash organize. And we're going to have a link here in the show notes as well. So you can click on it. But again, it is theproductivityshow.com slash organize. And uh, we'll have a webinar coming up relatively soon where you can uh, sign up and attend live. And if you can't attend live, we'll have a recording for you available as well. We're, we're, we will walk you through how we organize thousands of photos, notes, and files in a really an easy, systematic way. So if you're interested in that, go check out that URL. And uh, next week's episode is all about uh, how to win back one and a half hours a day. And it's going to be related to today's topic as well, which is about digital organization. So you definitely don't want to miss out on that as well. Because I think, Brooks, you and I, we both know this inherently. But I think a lot of people, what they don't understand and oftentimes don't realize is when they're at work, uh, they're dealing with a lot of email attachments. They're dealing with a lot of files. They're dealing with a lot of meeting notes. And it's really frustrating and time consuming sometimes to try to find all sorts of different things, but you don't either find them or it takes a while before you find that specific photo or image or illustration that you need. And sometimes you end, end up wasting five to 10 minutes. And the question we always get when we tell people, well, wouldn't it be nice if everything was organized like this? People always say, well, it's a really worth the effort of even getting started with organization. I have like thousands of files to deal with. Like how much time can this really save me? Uh, I would rather deal with it right then and there rather than going on this organization project, right? Uh, because a lot of people will just say, hey, you know, I can't even think about this right now. I have a deadline coming up. Like there's just no way I have time uh, to do this stuff. I don't even have time for a lunch break. <laughs> how, how do I even find time to organize all my stuff? And the thing is, when you take that approach, you're always going to end up with all these inefficiencies and all these five to 10 minute tasks that rob you of your time. And we call these time squanders. So a time squander is like a five to 10 minute task that is totally pointless and useless that you can oftentimes eliminate and uh, is oftentimes very inefficient. So an example of this is uh, all of us have been part of big email chains, right? Where we have like 20 people on the email thread and we're sharing files and documents and there's like a version 17 of a presentation somewhere. And then maybe a week later you go, oh yeah, I need to look at that presentation deck some, at some point. Uh, and then you go through your email inbox, you're trying to find <laughs> that specific presentation and you have to read through like 20 emails to find what the latest version is. So you have to write one, right? That process alone can take sometimes up to 10, 15 minutes, right? That's what we call a time squander because it's totally uh, ineffective and you don't have to be in a place where you have to dig through emails to find that specific file presentation or photo, right? What if you actually had that document saved somewhere and you could access it within two or three seconds, Imagine doing that like five to 10 times a day 
you could free up easily over an hour. And that's like the big new opportunity that we want to share with you here today is that if you can eliminate a lot of those time squanders throughout your whole working day and even in your personal life, imagine all the things that you can do with an extra five to eight hours a week, right? So the big idea here is that if you streamline a lot of those things here by saving the little time squanders and getting rid of them, you can have a lot of free time that you went back in a week. I mean, Brooks, what would you do with an extra hour a day or an extra five to seven hours a week? Oh my gosh, if I had that extra time, uh, I think what I would probably do is use it for uh, learning opportunities. So that's that's one thing I would probably do. Uh, we always feel like we don't have enough time to like take that extra course or do that, do that extra professional development or just learn something that isn't, you know, related to our job. Uh, if I had that much extra time, that's probably what I would do uh, throughout the week. How about you? For a lot of people, when I asked them the same question, they would love to spend more time with family. They would love to read more books. They would love to take their kids out for an afternoon. Uh, Cause sometimes those time commitments take like three to four or five hours. Right. However, if you free up a 10 minute task and do that six times in a day, that's an extra hour that you can potentially win back, which you can use for reading more books. All right. Uh, because for example, if you read 20 pages a day, right. That's like 30 books a year. Just think about that. And that's something I know you do Brooks, because every morning you spend about, you know, 10, 15 minutes reading 20 pages or so. Um, to kind of get your day started. And guess what? You end up reading over 30 books a year. And it just starts with something so small and simple as reading 20 pages a day. Imagine what it can do and what's possible for you when you eliminate, you know, five to 10 minute tasks throughout your whole day. So All right. with, yeah. with that premise <laughs> out of the way, let's start with uh, three ways you can organize your files, notes, and photos. So Brooks, I'm going to give you the first one here. What's the first way for us to organize all of this stuff? All right. This is going to be a very, very simple tip, but it is one of my favorite tips. And it's something that saves a lot of time. It definitely saves me a lot of time every single day. And uh, I know it will save you too, if you're not already doing that. And that is to add your key folders to your sidebar. So whether we're talking Windows File Explorer, whether we're talking about the Finder in Mac, whether we're talking about your email program or Evernote or OneNote, uh, Google Drive, you know, whatever it is that you use to work with your files, or whatever notes or whatever, a super powerful strategy is to take those key folders that you use. Maybe it's the folders that you are uh, working with all the time, like say a digital inbox or the folders where you store your key documents. Maybe it is temporary folder. So maybe you have like an ongoing project or a client file that you're working on while you're working with it, put it in your sidebar. Then you always have one click access to it. And then when you're done, you can take it out. And this has really, really two big benefits. Number one, when you need to file something away. So when you're saving information, you have one click access to that location. And on the flip side, when you want to access a location, it's the same thing. It's right there, one click away. You don't have to navigate through uh, a folder tree or a notebook tree or stacks in Evernote or whatever it is that you're using. It's right there available for you. And most of our systems have those pre-filled kind of system folders and locations but not as many of us know that you can usually add your own uh, add your own things there. So I do this all the time uh, for myself. I have my inbox where I save my scan documents and other things that I download that I want to file away. I have that right in my sidebar. I have what I call my reference folder, which is where I save my, uh, it's kind of like my filing cabinet. I have that in my sidebar. And then I have some kind of project related folders for agent efficiency right there in my sidebar because these are things I access all the time. Uh, so this is a really, really simple, but really, really powerful tip. And if you're not already doing it, highly recommend it. I'm going to take it a step further uh, because a lot of listeners might be a little bit more advanced. And um, I would say, even if you are in that camp, uh, chances are you probably access a lot of folders that you don't have in your favorites list. And again, this doesn't just apply to files and folders, right? Like if you're on Mac, whenever you have like um, 
an open a window dialogue or anything like that, you can have like quick access to stuff like that, but usually it requires a separate app. And this is one of my secret weapons called default folder X. So if you're on a Mac, go check this out. It's actually part of set app nowadays too. And it allows you to quickly save to a recently accessed folder. So it doesn't just have to be part of your favorites list. Uh, if you navigated to a folder recently somewhere in Finder uh, with a really simple, simple shortcut, it will actually access that recent folder that you accessed, right? So even if it's not part of your favorites list. And so this is something I use all the time because for example, I deal, I'll deal with uh, blog posts a lot because I'm writing a lot of them. And then if I need to save like an image or something somewhere uh, that I found on the internet, then uh, typically in the past, I would have to like click around, right? In order to get to the right folder where the blog post is hosted. However, with default folder X, I can press like one quick short key and it will automatically go to the most recent uh, folder that I visited. And it will actually memorize the last five or so that you've been to. So you can quickly navigate back and forth to the ones you visited. So it's one of those little things, but it saves you so much time in a day. And I probably save like 30 to 40 minutes every single day just with this little utility. And so uh, even if you're in the advanced camp, uh, one, use the favorites feature, right? And you can apply this in every single app. It does not apply just to Windows or Mac specific things. For example, in Evernote, you can have your your favorites notes as a simple example, right? I use this all the time for my morning routine so I can kind of qu quickly access it and see what I need to do. I use this for my weekly planning. Uh, every Sunday when I review my week, I have like a checklist of things that I go through and I quickly access it by, by clicking on it in the favorites uh, section as well. And so any app that you use, look at its favorite options if it has one and then put stuff in there. And it takes about maybe... I don't know, two minutes to do right now, but it can save you so much time down the line. Again, it's one of those time squanders that we don't consider, but once you see it and you, and you start using it, you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't do this earlier. I'm a big fan of default folder X too, so I'm so glad you mentioned it. Uh, I know there's a kind of Windows kind of almost equivalent called recent X. Uh, but if you're a Mac user, really recommend checking out. It's one of those things that I keep expecting to break every time there's a Mac OS up upgrade, because it seems like the sort of thing that would break, uh, but somehow they do a good job keeping current. And uh, yeah, that's another app that I use all day, every day. All right, so that is tip number one. Uh, before we move on to tip number two here, I wanna give a special shout out to all of our TPS Plus subscribers. So this is the upgraded version of the Productivity Show where you get episodes ad free and a week early. Plus you get access to bonus audio courses that we have for members only, along with a bunch of other benefits. And if you become a subscriber today, you also get a t-shirt from us that says one tweak a week, which is the whole idea of like small changes lead to big results. Kind of like how today's topic is relevant, right? If you can make small changes to how you manage your files, notes, and photos, it can lead to big results, meaning five to eight hours of free time potentially winning that back, right? So if you love our show and you want to support it or you want to get extra bonus content from us, go check it out at theproductivityshow.com slash plus. And thanks everyone who has already subscribed and is a member right now. All right, let's move on to tip number two here. And that is to have a consistent, descriptive, and simple naming convention, right? So tip number one was all about how to access stuff very quickly. But tip number two, when it comes to digital organization is making sure whatever you're saving something or creating something that you have a consistent, descriptive and simple naming convention, right? I'm sure we've all dealt with files that are called meetingnotes.doc or uh, vacationphoto.jpg. And you go, oh my gosh, what is this? And now you have to open it, right? And then you have to go through hundreds of files to figure out which one you were actually looking for. And oftentimes we can't even find stuff because if we're trying to search for something and it doesn't have a descriptive name, we can't even find the things that we're looking for, right? So in my opinion, how you name something in your digital organizational system or knowledge management system or whatever you want to call it is by far the most important component. Because if you don't know how to name something, it makes it so difficult to find it. And we can't really rely sometimes on just the content because sometimes we can only find stuff by name. Because if we have to dig through 
you know, terabytes of data of contents where it says like, hey, I'm looking for, you know, a, a bill from uh, my electricity company and it's embedded in the document that's a, that's a PDF. Uh, imagine you're having like thousands of PDFs on your computer. It could take like sometimes, you know, an hour to find that stuff, depending how many files you have, right? But we can quickly find stuff if we name something properly, whether it's a file, a photo, a note, an Evernote, or OneNote, or whatever you use. And I know, Brooks, you're a big, big believer of naming something. Um, and you were the one who actually, you know, is a big proponent of like teaching people even way before Asian efficiency and joining the team about like how to name something. So could you kind of like give your philosophy here? Yeah. And really, I, I totally agree with what you said that the having a name is really is the biggest part of organization because it just lets you find things later. Uh, it kind of like covers up a lot of <laughs> a lot of sins with the rest of your system. Like the better you name something, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to find it later, no matter where it is in your organization system, no matter how lazy you get with the rest of the filing and stuff like that, the better you do at naming something, the more likely you are to actually be able to find it again. And that's why we are doing all this, right? We're, we're doing the work to organize things, not just because, you know, for some OCD reason, because we like things neatly organized, we're doing this so that we are able to get to the things we need later. This is something that a lot of people don't really think about is the goal for what we're doing here. And everything has to be put through the lens of being able to find this stuff later. Otherwise, why, why bother? And really my thinking for this actually began many, many years ago. Uh, I was at the very first Evernote conference back in 2011 and uh, Brett Kelly, who I think has maybe been on the podcast before, uh, uh, he's a friend of yours, Tan, I know, a friend of mine. And he was doing his very first public speaking and he said uh, when he's naming, he was talking about naming Evernote notes, but this applies to anything. What he said, which has stuck with me ever since 2011, is you want to think of your future you. You want to think about when you're saving something, how are you going to, to look for this later? What are some words that pop into your mind now that you would look for this later and have those in the name of your file, your document, your Evernote note, your OneNote note, your photo, like whatever it is that you're saving with. You don't want to be afraid to use a longer name. Yeah, it might take a, a half second longer to add, you know, one or two more words, but having a longer name, even if it's like four words or something like that, is great. It's no problem because that just gives you additional ability to be able to find it later. One thing we like to do, uh, and this is, <laughs> we're going to get into a little bit of a difficult territory here um, because we're going to be describing this stuff on an audio podcast. So like Tan said, you may want to consider signing up for the webinar that we're going to be giving soon, uh, the productivityshow.com forward slash organize, where we're going to be showing this stuff on screen. <laughs> but basically uh, the, what we like to do, what we recommend that you do is always have the, the date in the file name or the note name or whatever it is. Uh, and we like to have that at the start. So some people like to have like year dash month dash day. Some people don't like to have dashes. Um, however you want to do it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's whatever is easiest and makes sense to you. The important thing is that you be consistent. So if I was naming, say, a, a credit card bill for or a, a bank statement or something for, uh, for April 30th, what I might do is call it like, 2021-04-30 Citibank joint account.pdf or something like that. And so I know I've got the date in there. It's Citibank. It's my joint account that I have with my wife. And it's for, um, for April. And then I know later when I'm looking for that, I can find it. Uh, and you can extrapolate this to meeting notes, to even photos if you want. Uh, it's, uh, there's so many different ways you can do it. But the key is to, first of all, have the date in there if possible. And second of all, be as descriptive as possible. Always thinking, as we said, how are you going to look for this later? Yeah, I would always recommend the more descriptive you are, the better, because there's very little downside to be very brief, if that makes sense, right? So like uh, Phil, as an example, here in the live chat is saying, you know, one of the things he wishes he had done is uh, 
a lot of times when it comes to naming something with using the years, he would use the last two digits, like 07 as an example, right? Or 17, uh, which would be you know 2007 or 2017. But it can make things uh, a little bit more difficult sometimes to find something, especially if you later decide to change it to being four digits or something like that, right? And so um, I would always recommend using all digits if possible. So Y, 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 Y. M M D D, right? So four digit number for a year, for uh, two digit for a month, and two digit for a um, day. And so that way you keep it really consistent. And no matter if you're in the United States or in Europe or whatever date format you use, if you know it's always starting with a year, you avoid any sort of confusion, right? And then anyone who's lived in the United States or came from Europe or moved between those two continents and other parts of the world knows like, it's always weird when you're looking at dates sometimes because you're not sure if this is a month or a day, right? And what order something is presented. And uh, when it comes to naming something, the sort of philosophical, the approach I would actually take is the extra two seconds it takes to name something can save you minutes or hours in the future. So to give an example, it might take an extra three seconds to uh, name that Citibank joint account that you have, right, Brooks? But in order for you to find it in the future, you would avoid minutes, if not multiple hours of clicking through PDFs opening them, scanning them, seeing if this is the right one, if it's not closing it and then moving on to the next one, right? And you can do this for hundreds of files and go, oh my gosh, I'm looking for this one specific thing for my tax account or reporting or something else. And you go, oh my gosh, I can't find it. What do I do now? And you have to go through like hundreds of files and it can be really frustrating and really draining. And anytime a task like that comes up, you know, you can avoid it and say, you know what, I'm going to procrastinate on it because it's probably going to take a while before I actually find it, right? So those extra two or three seconds uh, of investing in the name can save you so much time down the line. And so if you just know how to name something, it makes it so much easier to find stuff in the future. And I like the, the idea that you proposed there too by Brett, which is think about your future self. If you had to find this in the future, what would you type to find this? And my personal recommendation is always to use a minimum of four keywords. So like it could be a year, it could be a name, a noun, or something descriptive. Um, even when it comes to like photos, you could be like, this could be Tan, and this could be Tan and Mom, and Tan and Nam and Kim, which are my two brothers, or Tan and, and Kim, or and Tan and Nam. And so you have all these different variations, but at least now you can quickly find photos. And so if I'm looking for a photo with me plus my two brothers, I can quickly find it also. But if I need to find like a photo of just me and one of my other brothers, um, I can find that as well, right? So the naming makes such a big difference. And so the approach that most people have, uh, the analogy I like to give there is they think like a firefighter. So they'll name whatever comes to mind. They're thinking about the present. They're dealing with, with it right now. It's really pressing. It's urgent. They're just trying to get it you know, out of the way and get it over with, right? And just deal with it as if you, know, uh, you have to like fight for your life and move on to the next big thing now. However... Uh, I like to think of it as being a chess player. So if you want to actually think one or two steps ahead and anticipate what might happen in the future and then make that move. And in this case, how you would think one or two steps ahead is how would you name this? How would you search for this in the future? Or if I needed this in the future, what would I do or type or search for in order to find or access this document? And once you think about that, that's how you would name your something. Uh, name something, right? And so you want to think like a chess player and essentially think one or two steps ahead. So you know, you're helping yourself in the future, not be dreadful and wasting time and have another time squander on your hand where you're like wasting, you know, five to 10 minutes finding something that could have been accessed in one or two seconds. Yeah. Jan uh, Jeanette in the chat gives a great example and, uh, and, you know, we talked about description, but sometimes you can put other things in there that you find are, are helpful. Some people I know put like, if they're filing away invoices, they put the amount of the invoice in the file name. I don't personally do that, but I know people do. Uh, and Jeanette is saying that she uses 
She works with a lot of uh, documents that have, and it's the most important thing about that document other than, you know, who it's for is the expiration date. So she also adds those to the name so that she doesn't even have to open the document to see it. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Your name has to be something that serves you uh, and, and that serves what it is that you're trying to do. So that, that's a great tip uh, for customizing the date to work for you. Yeah. And if you're wondering, okay, what's a good practice or best practice for naming something? Uh, we have that covered on the webinar. So again, it's much easier to explain and teach and show you on a visual for format and platform rather than audio. <laughs> so if you want to learn our naming system and our naming convention that we use at Agent Efficiency and in our personal life, uh, go register for the webinar and we'll send you, uh, and we're going to show you how we do it. So again, it's theproactivityshow.com slash organize. So again, that is tip number two, right? Have a consistent, descriptive, and simple naming convention. All right, let's move on to tip number three here, and that is to create an easy organization system. So where we think most people fail at this is that they're never being taught how to organize digital information. And uh, the foundation or template or fundamentals are not there. And so it makes it really easy for us to kind of like get messy, screw up, put stuff um, all over the place and make sure that we actually never pay attention to it, <laughs> right? So no one has taught us how to manage an email inbox. No one has taught us how to manage thousands of files and notes and photos, right? And because we have no foundation or structure, more importantly, in place, uh, it allows us to be really messy and we have to rely on brute force and kind of finding stuff by random in order to get the things that we need, right? And so the analogy I like to give here is um, everyone has a home, right? And you have a kitchen, you have a bedroom, you have a bathroom, right? And there's certain things that belong in certain rooms. If you had a knife, right? you wouldn't put that in your bedroom, right? Unless you wanted to protect yourself or something, right? But you also wouldn't use it in the bathroom, right? Uh, same thing, if you had a bath towel, you wouldn't put it in your kitchen area. Even though you're storing it, it's not really in the right place. And if you needed it, it's not quickly accessible, right? So you, when you think about your home, there's like certain rooms have like a certain theme or certain structure where certain things belong, right? Just like your keys belong in a certain area. And whenever you're searching for your keys, you know where they are because they're, they have a home. Like everything has a home. That's a big concept that we have in our system. And so a lot of people don't know what that home is for their system, right? And because there's no system in place, it, it gets lost. And so Brooks is one of the geniuses behind all of this because he essentially created what we call an easy organization system, uh, EOS. Um, and the, we call internally like the triple A method because it, uh, it classifies how you would categorize something. So Brooks, can you explain to people how it works and how you discovered this? Yeah, well, like you were saying, the I've done a lot of thinking about why it is that most organization projects fail. And like you said, it's because a lot of times people just start doing it. They don't really give too much thought about everything that needs to happen. But another reason why is just most systems are just too complicated. Uh, we, we call it easy organization system for a reason is because people you know, maybe they read about it online or whatever, and they, or they, you know, spend way too much time overthinking this stuff. And they come up with these really elaborate filing systems and these really complicated systems that just take too, first of all, they take too much work. Uh, they seem good at first, but over time, it just becomes a hassle to remember where to save things. Or maybe it's like a hassle trying to dig through their folders or albums or notebooks to find what it is that they need. And it's because their system is just too complicated. And so really what what I've tried to do and we've tried to do is think to ourselves, what is a simple system that first of all has worked really well for us, but second of all, had, 
is allows us to be really, really focused on what we're, we need to focus on and when we need to focus on, but everything else is still really easy and really accessible. Uh, and so that's why uh, we came up with what, you, like you said, what we call uh, the triple A method. And this is something that people in the chat room, uh, the live stream chat have been asking about. So I hope you're very happy <laughs> to finally uh, uh, discuss the triple A method. And really what we found is you want to segregate your files, your notes and your photos into kind of like three top level organizations. And so that's where the AAA comes in. The first one is active. So A, active. And this is anything you're currently working on. So it could be a work project, but it doesn't have to be. It could also be like a kid's sports season, stuff related to that. It could be a relationship you're developing with somebody. It could be a course you're taking. Uh, it could be anything. It's something that right now you want to be focused on. That is your active session. The next thing is what we call assets. So that's the second A of the AAA, assets. And these are things you wanna have handy to refer to, but you're not like currently working on or working with. So it could be maybe reading materials. It could be your someday maybe uh, stuff in a GTD parlance. It could be like photos you wanna have stored away. It could be menus, it could be reference material. It could be your paperless documents that are scanned. These are all kind of go under the, the heading of assets. So they're not cluttering up your active working stuff, but they're there right there when you need them. So that's the second A, assets. And then the third A is the archive. So these are things that you don't need, but you wanna keep stored just in case you need to act it, access it in the future. So these are kind of like the opposite of the active. These are the inactive. So when you're done with that client project, when you're done with, um, that your kid's sports season, but you don't want to like delete the stuff. You want to keep it for whatever reason. When you're uh, done with the course that you're you're currently taking, uh, you don't need to have it like right handy. You can put it away to your archive so it's not cluttering up the rest of your stuff. And the great thing about having a really simple, easy system like this is it is totally platform independent. So you can use it on Mac, you can use it on Windows, you can use it on mobile, you can use it with files on your computer, you can use it in Google Drive, Dropbox, uh, Evernote, task managers. If you wanted to, you could use it in your email program. Really anything that you want to apply organization to you can set up a simple system like this. And again, <laughs> we keep saying this, but it's true. You know, this is an audio podcast. Uh, if, if what I just said isn't really clear, it'll make a lot more sense visually uh, if you go to uh, theproductivityshow.com forward slash organize. Uh, but hopefully this makes sense. The, the AAA system segregating things into your active stuff, your assets, and your archive. An example of this, how I apply this both uh, in the physical world and in a digital world would be as an example in the physical world, um, I have a lot of books at home, right? So I have books that I'm currently reading. These would be considered quote unquote active books, right? These are books I'm actively reading right now. And these are the ones that are uh, in my bedroom oftentimes because that's where I do most of my reading. I have like a chair there and I'll sit there and I have like one or two books that are sitting there that I'm actively reading. So those are the ones that I'm trying to actively finish. Like I have like a project or a goal that's related to this. And this is where the active stuff belongs, right? Then I have a bunch of books that I consider assets. These are things that I need handy and that I need to refer to every now and then. Um, and so I have those at my desk. So I usually have a stack of books near my desk that I'm always referring back to. It could be like a copywriting book for ideas, it could be a marketing book. It could be like something that is scientific literature, uh, research papers that I'm always referring back to because I need to find a certain statistic or ideas or different uh, like angles to use in whatever we're trying to teach, right? So that's something what I would consider an asset. And then I have stuff in the archive, which is basically my bookshelf. My bookshelf is essentially my archive, which houses all the books that I'm really you know, don't actively need right now. Um, they're considered 
uh, stuff that I would like to at some point maybe check out, but they're not really stuff that I you know use day to day or even on a weekly basis. But I like to keep it stored, right? I'm not getting rid of it. They're just inactive. And that's what the archive uh, structure is there. And so when you think about it that way, um, you can apply that to anything, right? Whether it's Evernote, right? You can have notes that are part of your active area where you have like stuff related to your projects, to your goals, anything that you're currently working on right now, right? Then you can have notes that are belonging in the asset buckets, which are stuff that you frequently uh, want to refer to, but aren't currently actively working on right now, right? So it could be something like, um, a morning routine checklist that I use, or it could be like a weekly planning checklist that I use in Evernote because I, I don't need to work on it. I already have it. I just need to reference it every now and then, right? It could be also other stuff like meeting notes or quarterly goals that I reference and so on. And then I have stuff in the archive bucket, notes that I really don't need that much anymore. And they're just kind of like put away. And oftentimes the idea here is out of sight, out of mind. I'm a big believer of that too. It's like, if I don't see it, I don't have to like mentally take up any space about it. And so I know that I could always find it if needed, but it's, if it's not visually there, I can focus on what's currently in front of me, which is oftentimes the active stuff and the assets that I need, right? And again, you can apply this to OmniFocus, right? If you followed our OmniFocus course, you would see that this a hierarchy is kind of there too, like active stuff, stuff that you reference every now and then, which is the assets and then the archive stuff that you don't really use uh, that much anymore, but still want to add, you know, every now and then access if needed, right? So you, again, the beautiful method, which we call the AA method or triple A method is all about how do you apply this to whichever platform you use? So again, whether you're on Windows, Mac or whatever, it doesn't really matter. You can apply this to anything. And so it's easier to demonstrate, right? On a visual platform. So again, if you wanna learn from us on how we do this and how you can apply this to your personal life, whether you use different devices and so on, uh, go check out that webinar uh, so we can show it to you in person, okay? So again, that's tip number three, and that is to create an easy organization system. And you can use the triple A method here to kind of get sort, sorted and start it there as well. All right, we're coming to the end of the show here, Brooks. I know you and I have talked a lot about this stuff. And again, we want to encourage people to sign up for the webinar because we want to show you on screen how to do this, because it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to kind of show and tell. Uh, so if you want to be part of our webinar or get the recording of it, go to theproductivityshow.com slash organize. And the first step that I would recommend that people do is to start dragging your favorites folder into your sidebar and start noticing how often you start to use those favorite folders. And uh, if you already have it set up and you want some extra credit, I would say start noticing how often you are looking for files for notes or photos and you can't find them chances are you're going to notice how much time you're wasting throughout the day if it's not in your consciousness just yet. So those are two things I would recommend you do next. Again, next week's episode is all about uh, how to win back one and a half hours a day with this productivity strategy that, we're going to that we are going to reveal on the new episode. And again, if you want to have links to everything that we talked about today, you can go to the show notes at theproductivityshow.com slash 351. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next Productive Monday.